Good afternoon, Good afternoon. The first witness today is Sir Frank Atherton, currently the Chief Medical Officer for Wales. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. <coughs> Could you commence, please, by giving your full name? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, uh, Doctor Sir Frank Atherton, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer for Wales. So Frank, thank you very much for your assistance to the inquiry. As you give evidence, could you please remember to keep your voice up so that we may hear you clearly, and also that your evidence may be recorded by the stenographer. You have provided a, a witness statement dated the 20th of April 2023, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. uh, There we have it on the screen, uh, and it's a, a statement to which you've appended your signature thereby agreeing to the statement of truth. There we are. You are currently the Chief Medical Officer for Wales, but before that, were you uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer for Health in Nova Scotia, and before that, President of the Association of Directors of Public Health. So you have a long and distinguished career in the field of public health and medicine. I'd like to start, please, by asking you some questions about the position of the Chief Medical Officer and the officials who assist you within the Government of Wales. Um, may we please have up the organogram 204014 at page 10? It's a, a diagram, Sir Frank, which is um, difficult to, to, to take stock of at first, but you will see your position, Chief Medical Officer, halfway down the left-hand side of the large blue box in the middle. Population Health Directorate, mm -hmm. Chief Medical Officer. Just above that box and to the right, there is Director General Health and Social Services and the Chief Executive of the NHS. Is that the post, the Director General of Health and Social Services Group, to whom or to which you report as the Chief Medical Officer? Yes, it is. And that post, Director General, reports, um, does he not, to the... Permanent Secretary of the Welsh Government. That's correct, yes. All right. And we're hearing from the Permanent Secretary to the Welsh Government, Dr Goodall, next. As the Chief Medical Officer, are you as essentially the, the, the core or, or the, the central advisor to the Welsh Ministers and the Welsh Government in relation to public health matters, as part of which are you also the Medical Director to the NHS in Wales? Yes, I, I, I often think of my role as CMO in three domains, actually, rather than two. But the, the first one, as you rightly say, is to provide advice to the Welsh Ministers and the Welsh Assembly. Uh, the second one, I'm, I'm the medical director of the NHS, so I work closely with the medical directors on um, uh, the, their efforts to deliver high-quality health services. And the third element, which I take as a, a public health specialist, is to be an advocate on behalf of the health of the population. So three roles, really. If we look at the box, we can see that the box into which your post falls as Chief Medical Officer includes also Population Health Directorate. It, is that a, a nod to the fact that one of the important aspects of the Chief Medical Officer's role is to be concerned with the health of the Welsh population. So in, in Wales, the, uh, the CMO role has not been purely advisory. Uh, it also has a, um, uh, a directorate function, so a policy function within uh, the Health and Social Service Group, which is uh, chaired by the Director General of Health and Social Services. 
so, so the Population Health Directorate delivers on uh, health policy, and that's health policy in terms of public health, as you rightly say, uh, but, but um, uh, formally it also included primary care, uh, and, um, uh, and of course it includes health protection, so public health, health protection. It also encompasses the function of research and development within health, uh, so there are a number of functions within the directorate. And is that directorate, Population Health, what was formerly known as the Health Policy Directorate until 2018? Correct. To which there are multiple references in Correct. the paperwork. Yes. So, as part of your function then, you are concerned as the director of that part of the Welsh Government, the Health Policy Directorate or the Population Health Directorate, concerned with primary care, health care quality, major health conditions, public health, and research and development in that field. Indeed. All right. To what extent are you responsible also for health emergency planning? So within the, um, the directorate, there is a uh, health emergency preparedness unit, uh, and I am the lead director uh, for the health and social service group in terms of emergency preparedness. Uh, so I report, uh, I, um, the, the, the Health Emergency Preparedness unit, unit reports to me and I report through, uh, to the Director General. So just pausing for a moment then on that, within your directorate, or rather within the Directorate of Population Health, of which you are the Director, there is a unit called Health Emergency Preparedness Unit, HEPU. Yes. We'll see a lot of that later. And through you, that unit reports up to the Director General of Health and Social Services. Indeed, yes. All right, which is the box above you in the chart. Are you, or to what extent does the role of being the Chief Medical Officer in Wales differ from being a civil servant? Well, I am a civil servant, um, so I subscribe and uh, follow the civil service code. I'm also a doctor, so I, um, I have a medical code that I uh, follow. Um, uh, but the role of the CMO uh, is slightly different from that of any other civil servant in that we have, a, by custom and practice, a degree of uh, independence. And so I am expected to independently give advice to uh, to, to ministers. Um, that's not enshrined, I don't think, in law anywhere, but it's a, it's a custom and practice uh, that, uh, and an expectation that I will give um, uh, my advice freely and uh, impartially. And so by virtue of being the CMO, uh, although nominally a civil servant, you, you are in fact in practice afforded a high degree of independence when you come to report to the Welsh Government and a high degree of separation from their day-to-day -day concerns. Exactly so. All right. And in, in your experience, have ministers in the Welsh Government generally been receptive to the advice which you have provided from time to time? Uh, I would say they've always been receptive. They haven't always followed it diligently or uh, uh, entirely, but uh, they've always listened very carefully to what I've had to say. Is there a chief medical officer directorate or unit around you? We've heard evidence that, um, for example, in, in England, there is an office of the chief medical officer, which has a number of staff, um, and in Scotland, within the director hmm. general in which the CMO sits in Scotland, there are also a number of staff particularly concerned with being, well, they're particularly concerned with the, the functions of the Chief Medical Officer. Do you have such a body around you? Well, I, I do now. Um, going into the pandemic and before the pandemic, I would say I had um, you know, some, some support around me, uh, but it was really quite, quite a small resource. Uh, that really is uh, quite different now. So. Uh, really, it was an administrative support that was wrapped around me in the first instance. I now have a, an office of the Chief Medical Officer, uh, which provides me with quite considerable support in the work I do. All right. Now we're going to look in a little more detail at some of the specialist groups or entities that sit within the Welsh Government. Could we have 180757 up, please, at page one? And I don't know whether it's possible to do this, but perhaps have it alongside the organogram at 204. 014 at page 10. I should say that I haven't alerted um, our colleague who does this to that. If it's not possible, it, it's not possible. All right, well, there we have a, a, a planning group structure as at September 2018. 
which sets out the, the main bodies in the health and social services group. The health and social services group and the top line of this document is that the group in the blue box that we were looking at a few moments ago within the Welsh Government? I don't believe so. It was just to the left, in fact, and above the directorate of... The, 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 the Emergency Planning Advisory Group, as I understand it, is a, uh, it, it's a group chaired by the Welsh Government Health Emergency Planning Advisor, as it says, but that, that brings together the, um, the, the emergency planning leads from across all the NHS bodies in Wales. So it, right. it, it's not within the health and social care structure. It's, um, it sits between the health and social care and the, the NHS. Y yes, indeed. In fact, my question wasn't about the emergency planning advisory group. It was about the wording at the top, Welsh Government Health and Social Services Group. That is the body that we were looking at a few moments ago on the other... It is indeed, other, yes, yes. Right, on the other chart. So this is the Emergency Planning Advisory Group, which is a, an independent group which normally sits within the Welsh Government, but it includes a number of different groups. Will you take it from me that the Major Incident Response Partnership on the left and then the Wales Mash mass casualty group, the Wales T&E group and the pan flu preparedness group are all bodies which are on our main organogram mm -hmm. along with the health countermeasures group, mm -hmm. although that's in another part of the chart. Where does HPU, HCPU fit in? The, the, the um, HEPU, <laughs> Health Emergency Planning Unit, uh, coordinates the activities of the EPAG, the, 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 as, I, as I said, the, um, the EPAG sits between the Welsh Government and the, uh, the, the local health boards, uh, and the HEPU is the coordinating body of that. If, if I may assist, HEPU is formally within the Health and Social Services Group, which is itself part of the Welsh Government, whereas this structure is a semi-independent structure that reports into the Welsh Government. One of the reasons, Milady, for, for producing this document is it is a remarkably complex labyrinthine system. We'll come back to HEPU in, in more detail later, but essentially, was HEPU, is HEPU the body with primary oversight over pandemic preparedness for the purposes of the health bodies in Wales? It certainly coordinates the health co components of preparedness, yes. All right. And... What relationship did you have, or do you have as CMO, with HEPU? Really, my, my relationship is with the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the Health Emergency Planning Advisor, so David Goulding reports to me, uh, and he's the, he, he leads the HEPU. All right, so HEPU is within the Welsh Government. It's part of the Health and Social Services Group, that directorate to which we looked at earlier. Mm -hmm. But its lead planner, David Goulding, reports to you as the CMO because one of your hats is a Welsh Government hat as Chief Medical Officer to the Welsh Government. Yes. yes. All right. Could we have 204014, the organogram, at page 10, please? So that we can get our bearings, if you go to the, the large blue box in the middle and the left-hand side, you'll see Health and Social Services and the Chief Executive for NHS Wales, I think at one stage Dr Goodall, but above that it says Health and Social Services Group. Mm -hmm. That is the group that we saw on the other chart. And you can see on the far right-hand side of the page the, the, the names Wales Mass Casualty Group training and exercise group and pre-hospital major incident response partnership group. There are three of the bodies that we saw in the other chart. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the very far left-hand side, you will see the Welsh Government Countermeasures Policy Group. That was one of the other bodies we saw on the chart. And then finally, HEPU is on this chart under the blue box on the left-hand side. 
health emergency preparedness unit, but the line goes generally to the blue box, but it actually should go directly to the, through the chief medical officer, through you, to the health and social services group on the top of the box. Mm. Is that all correct? Um, I can't disagree with anything you say. All right. I'm, well, I'm very pleased to hear that, Sir Frank, because I simply couldn't do that again. <laughs> There is on this chart, you will see on the top right-hand corner of the right-hand large blue box in the middle, Chief Scientific Advisor. What relationship do you have within the Welsh Government with the Chief Scientific Advisor? Um, so the Chief Scientific Advisor sits alongside me. He, um, he, uh, he provides uh, science advice into the health and social care system. Um, I, w I was involved in uh, supporting the recruitment of that post. Um, I think that post uh, originally reported through me uh, to the Director General, but now reports directly to the Gen D Director General. Oh, I'm sorry, I do beg your pardon. I'm talking about the Chief Science Officer for Health. This is the Chief Science Advisor yes. for the Welsh Government. I do beg your pardon. So th that's a completely separate post, which is uh, uh, employed by the Welsh Government and um, would be on a similar level to the CMO, uh, expected to provide uh, scientific advice to the Welsh Government, impartial scientific advice. But you're quite right that underneath Chief Scientific Advisor, you can see within the box NHS Wales Chief Scientific exactly. Officer. Yeah. Is that a post which is concerned self-evidently <laughs> with health, because it's an NHS Wales post, and the scientific angle of health. That, that, that's exactly the post I was just uh, describing. describing exactly so. Now, thirdly, if you then go to the left and down a bit, we can see Chief Scientific Advisor Health. Is that a different post altogether, or have we mistakenly duplicated the Chief Scientific Officer within NHS Wales? Yeah. I believe you've mistakenly, or it has been mistakenly duplicated, I believe. Yeah. Oh, well, that's very good, because we can then cross that through and simplify marginally the chart. All right. There are a number of other bodies with which the CMO works, which I just would like you to identify, please. On the top left-hand corner of the organogram is that the UK Chief Medical Officers Group. Are you one of the UK Chief Medical Officers? I am. And therefore, do you have regular meetings with and a, and, a, and a fairly close working relationship with the other chief medical officers in the United Kingdom through that group? Yes, we do. Um, I mean, prior to the pandemic, um, of course, I've worked with two UK chief medical officers, Dame Sally uh, and uh, more recently Professor Chris Whitty. Um, and uh, with both those individuals, we've, we've, as chief medical officers across the four nations, we've always met on a quarterly basis, in, usually in person, and then more, uh, more frequently on an informal basis as needed. To the right of the UK Chief Medical Officers Group, we have Nerve Tag, about which we've heard a great deal. Is that a, a, a body which liaises with the CMO in Wales as with the other CMOs across the United Kingdom in relation to specifically the threats from respiratory viruses? Well, it is, as you say. Um, I don't believe that Wales has a, um, a, 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 um, a role or a a person on nerve tag, but it is uh, supposed to be a UK advisory uh, body, yeah. All right. In the witness statement of uh, Mr Vaughan Getting, and he of course is a senior Welsh minister, and he was at one stage, I think, I believe, Minister for Health and Social Services, um, he, he says, the relationship with the other chief medical officers, insofar as Wales was concerned, was complicated by the fact that the CMO in England is not just a UK CMO, but he, he or she advises the UK government, particularly in relation to areas in which there are UK-wide ramifications. So, to some extent, he or she may wear two hats, English CMO and UK advisor. Did you, have you encountered at any stage any difficulties in the relationship with the English CMO by virtue of that complicating feature of the need to discharge UK responsibilities? 
Um, personally, I haven't, no. Um, the, 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 um, the, the two CMOs I've worked with have always been very um, astute to the fact, alert to the fact that um, there are devolved competencies and non-devolved competencies. I suppose a good example would be in international development work where it's quite clear that because it's a non-devolved function, the UK... Uh, Chief Medical Officer sits on the WHO board and uh, has a primacy in the international uh, development agenda. Uh, but that doesn't preclude the other CMOs from having um, international relations with other, 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 other countries, for example. Uh, so it's never been a particular problem for me. Uh, it's, it's one that uh, we clearly understand the, 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 the respective roles, yeah. So maybe a, uh, an issue more of form than substance. I would think. All right. SAGE is another important body to which um, much evidence has been devoted. We can see it towards the top of the page, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. Over time, and, and bearing in mind that you've been the CMO since August 2016, have you had much involvement with SAGE yourself? Um, I haven't had an um, engagement with SAGE. Um, when SAGE has been active, and uh, it becomes active during emergencies, of course, um, the uh, CSA Health, Chief Science, Scientific Advisor for Health, has been our representative uh, on SAGE. All right. We'll come back to this issue a little later for, for, for reasons that will become plain, but did it become apparent when the pandemic struck that because the SAGE arrangement um, is a UK arrangement, there was a need within the Welsh Government for tailored scientific advice to be given to Welsh ministers, and therefore the Welsh Government set up a different body, I don't believe we've got it on the screen, but a different body called the Technical Advisory Group, mm -hmm. TAG, mm -hmm. along with an advisory committee called TAC, Technical Advisory Committee. Were you instrumental in the setting up of those two bodies? Was that something with which you were concerned? So, yes, it was. Um, I, I discussed that with our Chief Scientific Advisor for Health. Um, and the reason for setting up TAC, which I think is a technical advisory cell rather than committee, and TAG, which is the broader um, uh, network of, uh, of, of, of advisors, the reason for setting those up was that we felt that um, although it was very useful to have a position on SAGE, we needed to have a, a scientific forum where we could ask our own questions um, and where we could get detailed, uh, at that time modelling of course was uh, quite important to us and we, we needed more specific detailed modelling rega uh, with, with regard to Wales. So for those two reasons we set up the TAC and the TAG. All right, and those therefore are two bodies that, that we should really have or should be deemed to be on this chart going forward, this this Indeed. attempts to represent the position at yeah. 2019. It didn't exist in 2019. It didn't exist then, but, but going forward, they are important committees, or at least one is a cell, one is a group, yeah. because they provide for a, a Welsh perspective on matters that may otherwise be dealt with by SAGE. Well, in fact, going forwards, they, they, and they, they, they will continue, they are continuing, but they, they've been renamed as Science, science and Evidence uh, Group, uh, yes. Science Evidence uh, Advisory Group. I was about to come to that. <laughs> the third body to which it should make reference is STAC, S-T-A-C. Um, is that a, a further body which represents perhaps a tweak, if you like, on TAC and TAG? I'm sorry to get lost in the acronyms, but I don't recognise STAC. I recognise SEA, Scientific and Evidence Advisory uh, Group. But so we, we may need Thank to provide you. further clarity on that. Milady has heard a great deal of evidence about the risk assessment process by which risks are identified, owned, managed, and addressed and planned for in Westminster, of course, in relation to the United Kingdom, and in Edinburgh in relation to Scotland. As the CMO, did you have a hand in the drawing up of Welsh-centric risk assessment plans or commenting at any rate on the United Kingdom risk assessment process? So within the Health and Social Service Group, there was a risk register that uh, we contributed to 
um, and the HEPU would have provided the um, uh, the, in, the input into the uh, the overall HSSG risk register, and then the, the HSSG risk register would be would form a part or would merge into the overall Welsh government uh, risk register. As regards the UK uh, risk register, I don't recall ever having any personal input into the national risk register. If that's your question, can we just break that break that down um, a bit, please? So in, in Scotland, there is a, a Scottish risk assessment, which is a separate document. It's a variant, perhaps, of, of the United Kingdom mm -hmm. risk assessment policy or document. There is no analogous document for Wales, is that there's no Welsh risk assessment. But what there is, <coughs> is a governmental risk register, to which we'll look at, the mo uh, look at it in a moment, and also a risk assessment within the Health and Social Services Group, the HSSG body. Is that correct? Well, it is correct that the risk assessments are exactly as you described, whether there is an overall um, uh, risk, what was the other term you used, risk? Uh, Register. The, the analogous one to the, the Scottish one? The, it's called the Scottish risk assessment. Risk assessment, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Uh, you, you. You'd probably be better asking that of our civil contingencies colleagues perhaps later. All right. Could we have 21556, uh, 215556, please, the corporate risk register? I believe this is the, the, the governmental corporate risk register, so not the Welsh risk assessment, but the government's own corporate risk register, which in this form, January 16, was about six months before you were appointed as the CMO, we can see in the second column, resilience major emergencies. If we fail to provide effective leadership and coordination in ensuring that Wales is prepared for and resilient to the full range of national hazards and threats which it faces, then there is a, a risk to the health and well-being of its citizens. There are then a number of mitigating measures or mitigating actions in the large column in the middle, mm -hmm. controls in place referring to governance structures, coordination role of the Welsh Government under the Pan-Wales Response Plan, physical infrastructure, corporate Welsh Government response, multi-agency training programmes and so on. Mm -hmm. And importantly, what lessons may be learned from incidents and development of internal planning. As the CMO, were you aware of this corporate risk register for the Welsh Government? Was this something which, when you were appointed, you were made aware of, or to which you, you contributed in, in later variants. Well, it's certainly something I would have I would have been aware of. Um, I would have probably had more um, input to the health and social service risk register, which obviously fed into this. So yes. um, that that would be my main route of input. I would say. On its face, Sir Frank, th there appears to be very little detail concerning the the risk of pandemic influenza or of mitigating actions specifically directed towards the risk of pandemic influenza can you recall going back to 2016 the extent to which that was a risk which was specifically thought about and addressed in the, in the policy guidance and the registers to which with which you were familiar? Well, well, I can't recall. I, obviously, I wasn't here in January 16, but no, you know, no, sub in subsequent that. iterations, uh, certainly within the, um, the Health and Social Service Risk Register, I would expect there to be more detail. Uh, and as, of course, you go, you, you go up through the Welsh Government, then the, the detail perhaps gets lost. But certainly within the Health and Social Service Group, pandemic influenza was, um, was recognised as a material risk. Would you give me one moment, please, sir? Milady, that health and social services risk register is a specific document that we've sought, but we've yet to be provided with it. The, the statement from Mr. Vaughan Getting, to which I referred earlier, also says that, in a general sense, over the last five years, um, and, and particularly until he personally was briefed in Exercise Cygnus. There had been um, a, 
a lack of focus or interest upon preparedness in the Welsh Government. He says, preparedness was not a particular focus of interest or concern in the Government. And I don't remember any significant questioning on the topic either in Government, the Senate, in the media or elsewhere. Was it your experience that there was an insufficient focus or attention paid to preparedness as a, as a single issue? No, I mean, I, I, I would have, uh, the way I would articulate that would be that so at the official level, there was quite a lot of work going on around preparedness. Um, as ever, you, you know, you can, you can say, well, could, could more have been done? Uh, and that may be a valid question. But there was certainly, at official level, uh, quite a significant work going on around preparedness. That it wasn't escalated to ministers perhaps suggests that, you know, you know things, things get elevated to ministers when there's a decision to be made or when there's a, a problem or an intergovernmental problem. And so it may not have come to the minister's attention for that reason. But certainly at official level, there was uh, activity going on through the HEPU, through the emergency planning advisor group, through the local resilience fora. Uh, all, all of those structures were, were working on emergency preparedness. You've made reference to the United Kingdom Influenza Preparedness Strategy of 2011. Was that the strategy which formed the genesis for the Welsh Government's own strategies or frameworks for managing major infectious disease emergencies and also health and social care influenza pandemic preparedness? Well, partly. Uh, th th there are two different kind of things you mentioned there. First of all, the major uh, the major infection framework. Infectious diseases emergency disease framework. In, yes. <laughs> quite a mouthful, isn't it? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, it, it, th that really sprang from the fact that we had, we have in Wales had for a long time an outbreak control plan, which is the, the thing that we use as the kind of bread and butter to, to manage any outbreak of, uh, of infectious disease at local level. Going beyond that, um, when you get it, bigger outbreaks which affect more than one region or which are uh, not manageable through the outbreak control plan, the, the control framework that you just described is an attempt to uh, to describe how the system would respond to those kinds of emergencies. The, 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 the 2011 pandemic flu plan was a UK-wide document, which we, we agreed to in, in Wales. It uh, informed our, our planning as well in Wales. But I would say that sits alongside rather than hierarchically uh, around the framework. The same strategic approach, however, was adopted in the major infectious disease emergencies framework and in the influenza pandemic preparedness and response guidance as formed the, the, the basis for the 2011 UK document, yeah, correct? I think the responses would have, would have been consistent. Yeah. Yes. So the first one, the first document to which I've made reference, let's have that up. It's 183456 the Wales Framework for Managing Major Infectious Disease Emergencies. It's dated October 2014. If we could just scroll forward through, thank you to the contents page, you, we can see that it, it deals with major infectious disease emergency. It provides for a number of planning, assessment, uh, planning assumptions the management of initial cases, isolation, treatment facilities, treatment in the community, data collection, and countermeasures. To the extent that, at all, to the extent that it did address the, the possible outcomes of a major infectious disease emergency or of a pandemic influenza, was the approach of this framework the assumption that the greatest risk was a pandemic influenza, the risk of a new and or a high consequence infectious disease was less, and the most likely catastrophic consequences would ensure from a pandemic influenza. So the broad approach from the 2011 strategy. Well, I don't, I, I don't think the framework um, was predicated on pandemic influenza because we already had the 2011 pandemic uh, flu plan. Um, the the framework that we're looking at was really designed to cover a range of, uh, of infectious diseases which would, would not be manageable through the normal 
application of the outbreak control plan. So, so I, I don't think they're quite the same thing. I mean, certainly flu would fall within the scope of this framework. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, and certainly uh, pandemic flu, you know, in terms of pandemics, flu was seen as the most likely um, uh, infectious agent to, to cause a pandemic. Indeed. And if you look at countermeasures 14 on page 15, I'm not suggesting we go to it, but you can see in the index, infection control and PPE, vaccination, antibiotics, antivirals, the presumption, the working presumption was, wasn't it, that the countermeasures would be those usually associated with dealing with an influenza outbreak, namely the existence of antivirals, Tamiflu, vaccination, because there is a flu vaccine, of course, and the infection control and PPE would be hand washing and sensible personal hygiene methods as well as the PPE required for the treatment of flu. That was how the document approached it. Well, what you, you say is true, but you could equally apply those countermeasures to cholera or measles or a, a, a wide range of other infectious diseases. I don't think it was specific to, to flu, the, 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 the framework we're looking at. There was no debate, was there, Sir Frank, or any d discussion of the sort of countermeasures that might be suitable for dealing with a high-consequence infectious disease with catastrophic consequences that was not pandemic influenza. For example, mass diagnostic testing, mass contact tracing, how to deal with an HCID that had no antiviral and no vaccine. No, no you're, you're correct. I mean, right. th those uh, countermeasures were not considered within this framework or indeed within the 2011 plan. Yeah. Precisely. Could we have I say, one I say one? they were not... May I? May I uh, of course. Maybe, of course. Uh, I, I say they were, they were not, um, not dealt with. I mean, they, they were considered... They had been considered, of course, but discounted for, for various reasons and with the benefit of hindsight, uh, discounted without sufficient consideration. Thank you. 116503 is the response guidance of 2014... It itself avowedly refers, of course, to, to influenza pandemic preparedness. If we look at page three, please. We, we can see pandemic countermeasures in box four. Antivirals, national pandemic flu service, antibiotics, face masks and respirators, consumables, vaccination, specialist respiratory support. So self-evidently and sensibly, given that this is a influenza pandemic document, those are the sorts of countermeasures that are associated with um, an influenza pandemic. A third important document to which you've, you've, you've already made reference is the Pan Wales Response Plan of 2019. What was that? Well, the Pan Wales Response Plan is an overarching, as I understand it, is an overarching uh, plan for dealing with any civil emergency in Wales and it's the part of the civil contingencies approach uh, of working with partners across Wales uh, to respond to anything whether it be a, an infectious disease, flooding, uh, fires, um, a, 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 any threat to the public's health. The public. all, all right. That was a document which as you say deals generally with civil contingencies. It, it, it's concerned with emergency response and recovery, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So if we may put that to one side on the basis it wasn't concerned with pandemic influenza or, or high-consequence infectious disease, the two main guidance documents remain those two documents to which you've referred us, mm -hmm. the Wales Framework of October 14 and the guidance document of February 2014. Do you know whether either of those two documents was updated after 2014 or the subject of consideration for the purposes of being updated or rewritten? Mm. I don't recall them being updated. I think when we um, updated the outbreak control plan, there was a question raised by Public Health Wales as to whether what, what the status of the, the framework for uh, infectious disease major emergencies would be. Uh, and at that time, it was not uh, updated. Uh, but um, so, I, so I don't believe that there has been a process to update them. Now, in, in the history of United Kingdom emergency preparedness, the, the, the swine flu of 2009 was um, 
crucial, wasn't it? Be because, of course, as a result of that swine flu outbreak, there were a, a number of reports, outcome documents, as they're called, yeah, both in Westminster but, but also in the devolved administrations. Um, there was one in Wales, a, a report produced after the event by Mr Goulding, who was, I think, the head, or maybe now is the head of HEPU, to which you've referred, can we have that, please? 89599, page 4. 89599, page 4, paragraph 5.2. So as part of the morning session, a presentation was made by Dr. John Watkins on the risk and risks and effects of pandemic influenza. Current threats were described as genetic reassortment. And then over the page, please. Novel virus, natural reservoirs, the return of old enemies, planning assumptions to consider. Virus will arise somewhere else. A novel virus with little background immunity traditional groups for seasonal vaccine not applying, issues about virulence and transmissibility, and a vaccine not immediately being available, but anti and antivirals having some role but not a major impact, role of masks, social distancing, school closure, banning mass gatherings, etc. little evidence of effectiveness. So this document in October 2013, after the swine flu pandemic, shows that at this presentation or workshop, there was some debate revolving around the inherent unpredictability of a respiratory virus, of the possibility that there would be an outbreak for which there, was, there would be no vaccine immediately available, for which antivirals would have no major impact, and in which there would have to be consideration of some of the mm -hmm. additional countermeasures not normally associated with pandemic influenza, social distancing, school closure, banning mass gatherings. And I wanted to ask you, Sir Frank, to what extent, when you took office in 2000, or you took your post in 2016, do you recall there being any general debate about these topics in the Welsh Government? No, I don't recall there being any. Um, I, I think this document is um, a summary from uh, a workshop that was held. Uh, the the Health Emergency Planning Ad Advisory Group that we talked about earlier, which is the NHS bodies coming together with Welsh Government uh, Health and Social Care, has an annual conference. And I think in 2013, uh, they, the, their annual conference was focused on pandemic flu. And I think this is probably a record from that, um, from that meeting. Um, but, and this clearly, the, the, um, the, the lines you're, you're, you're showing here clearly are uh, part of a presentation given at that uh, at that uh, thing, I suppose you know what, what to me it says is that that was the understanding at the time that you know different viruses could emerge and could cause a pandemic. I think it was clear that was clear in the 2011 the assumption of the 2011 pandemic flu, although it was largely based on pandemic flu. It, it was stated, I think, in the 2011 strategy that other viruses could could cause um, other respiratory pathogens could cause. Um, pandemics as well. But the understanding at the time was that those final uh, assumptions, you know, the, the mass of social distancing, there was a predisposition against those, which I think is being reflected in this document. So to draw the threads together, the two documents, the Wales Framework for Managing Major Infectious Disease and the Wales Health and Social Care Influenza Pandemic Preparedness and Response Guidance, both of 2014, were never updated. They were based upon, or at least consistent with, the UK 2011 strategy. Mm -hmm. And whilst there was some debate at some levels of the Welsh Government about these planning assumptions mm -hmm. and the possibility that they might require being challenged, that they may not necessarily hold true, neither the guidance nor 
the challenge to those planning assumptions were ever taken forward in a significant sense prior to the pandemic hitting Wales. That's the position, is it not? Well, as I, as I read what's in front of me, it, it, it's not a challenge to the... It, it, it's stating that the, the role had very little... The role of these countermeasures had very little evidence. I, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I think we, we could and should have paid more attention to the, the what-if questions. You know, what if the virus was so different that we needed to, uh, to, 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 to go down some of these? But at the time, I think it's fair to say that, that, that those measures had been considered and somewhat prematurely dismissed. There was, as it turned out, a distinct and important role for face masks, for mass diagnostic testing, for mass contact tracing, and as we all discovered to our cost, mandatory quarantines. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't just a question of these measures having no efficacy. Mm -hmm. The thinking was never developed. There were no papers or policies drawn up to examine any of them in detail. And it was just assumed that there was nothing here to be seen or to be further thought about. That the, was, the thinking went into the ground. Yeah, I accept that was the, your point. That was the assumption in the 2011 strategy, and it was the assumption in the Hein report before that. So, yes, that is true. And the overarching guidance documents for pandemic influenza and HCIDs were never updated. Were, alongside this. Yeah, exactly, and they were based on the 2011 flu. And they themselves were based on yes. the thinking from 2011. I would agree with that. All right. Exercises and institutional learning. Before your tenure as Chief Medical Officer of Wales commenced in August 16, an exercise had taken place in Wales, had it not, in October 14, namely the Welsh part of Exercise Cygnus. Was it the Welsh part, because exercise signals for the United Kingdom was planned for 2014, but for a variety of reasons never took place, other than in Wales? That's my understanding, that uh, it was planned as a UK-wide exercise, but I think Ebola got in the way in terms of UK uh, participation, but there was a decision taken, as you say, before my time, to, uh, to run it in Wales, just to test the local arrangements. Could we have, please, 107136? These are the recommendations from the Welsh part of Exercise Cygnus, the part that took place in 2014. Um, WRPT, the acronym at the top right of the page, is, I think, a reference to Welsh Resilience Protection... Partnership Team. Partnership team. Thank you, Sir Frank. I knew you'd get there ahead of me. Exercise signals recommendations. Background. As a result of the ongoing high risk of an influenza pandemic, it was agreed that a Tier 1 UK exercise should be held in October 14. Exercise signals to assess preparedness at both a national and a local level. But, but it, as you say, the UK exercise never took place. There were initially 11 local resilience forums scheduled to participate at the local level in England, whilst Wales, all four local resilience forums agreed to take place. If we could just scroll back out, we can see the strategic objectives there set out. And further down the page, the reference to the postponement of the UK exercise Cygnus. Could we have then over the page, page two, issues raised. The following are the issues and recommendations to emerge from the strategic coordinating groups and the Wales Civil Contingencies Committee. Pausing there, as you understood it, was the position this, that because it was only the Welsh part of Exercise Cygnus that took place in 2014, the exercise focused on the local level, the local resilience forum, the strategic coordinating group level, rather than being a test of the entirety of Welsh civil contingency structures. Well, it's my understanding, but it was two years before I took it post, so I can't really comment a huge amount on that. So, Frank, you're plainly aware of that from the face of the document because it is only concerned with local resilience forums and yes. strategic coordinating groups. And presumably, once you became chief medical officer, you were briefed about exercise Cygnus in 2014 and the extent to which the recommendations to which we're about to return were being implemented. Were you not? 
well, I don't remember a specific briefing about it, but I, I would have been aware of it as we went into 2016 uh, Cygnus exercise, yes. Because that was the delayed United Kingdom Indeed. exercise yes. to which the Welsh Government was a participant, yeah. and you were no doubt informed, and you probably asked, to what extent are the recommendations from the first part of Cygnus been put into place by now? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the discussion about that, but yes. All right. Well, on this page, we can see the issues raised concern excess deaths, just the, the, the practical problems associated with dealing with large numbers of fatalities, communication, regulation, the reduction, and, the, and there's an example, the need for two signatures on a death certificate, resources, a reference to a national stockpile of resources, school closures, demands for data collection, and concern being expressed by one strategic coordinating group about the National Pandemic Flu Service, and then over the page, if you could scroll back out, please, vulnerable people. So those were the lists of concerns raised, and then scrolling back out, please, again, mm -hmm. the recommendations that are, that are made towards the bottom of that page, you can see recommendations one through to nine, concerning antiviral collection points, the legal position of staff movement in, in health board needs, a reference to the need for um, decisions at a national level to be made by the Welsh Government in respect to the NHS rather than at local lo level, criteria, I'm so sorry, when it moves it's quite difficult to follow it, criteria for declaring a flu pandemic, Five, Welsh Government Department for Education and Skills to update guidelines. Six, LRF Coordinators Group. Seven, Working Arrangements for the Wales Pandemic Flu Group and Wales Warning and Informing Group. Eight and nine, Welsh Government Social Services and Wales Mass Fatalities Group. To what extent do you recall, Sir Frank, those recommendations being implemented by the Welsh Government by the time that you took office in 2016? Um, well, there's a quite a complex range of them. Uh, we'd have to go down perhaps individually, but um, uh, I, the, the way in which from exercises, the various exercises that we had, and this was one of several, of course, before my time and during my time, the way in which those recommendations were being managed was that there was a, a database spreadsheet which was maintained by the HEPU, and that did log the recommendations and, and regularly track the progress against them. So somewhere in the system there will be a, um, a document which, which says at, at that point in time in 2016 when I took up post to what extent they were met and then subsequently they would have been updated. Can you recall in a general sense whether all the recommendations from the first part of Cygnus were implemented? I can't. Remember. All right. The recommendations did not cover or consider some of the areas which have turned out to be vital to the response, of course, to the COVID pandemic. For example, surge capacity or any need to stockpile or, or provide for PPE in the sorts of quantities which, which proved to be necessary or any of those other areas of countermeasures to which you were referred. Was that because the first part of Exercise Cygnus was only concerned with relatively quite a low level in the civil contingencies order down that tree of civil contingencies? I, I, I think it's partly that, right. uh, and, and partly that um, it, it's back to the point that it was predicated on what had happened in 2009 and the pandemic that we'd been through. So there's a lot of consideration in there about the distribution system for antivirals. In 20, 2009, we had to set, set that up from zero, as indeed subsequently we had to set up a lot of structures for COVID from zero. Uh, but that, those are the two reasons, I think, why, uh, wh why it is what it is, why the recommendations are what they are. Right, that's very clear. Then moving forward to the main United Kingdom exercise, Cygnus, in 2016, it was in October, so you were, would have been in post. You, you were appointed in August. Was the Welsh Government a full participant in the exercise? Do you recall? 
Uh, well, it was a participant, and uh, ministers were involved, officials were involved, and um, so yes, we were we were a participant in that. In terms of which parts of the Welsh civil contingency structure came under examination and were called upon to take part in the exercise, was the Welsh participation more limited than the Scottish participation because it had had its own, albeit quite local, exercise Cygnus in 2014 already? That may well be the case. I, I don't recall the details, but I don't recall that we tested the LRF structures in the set quite the same way, I could be, and probably because we had done that in 2014. Or the strategic coordinating groups, one presumes, because they had also been the subject of examination in 2014. Uh, I, I can't recall them being tested. All right. Do you recall, can you recall the extent to which those two documents the Wales Framework for Managing Infectious Disease Emergencies or the Wales Health and Social Care Influenza Pandemic Preparedness and Response Guidance were tested in the course of the 2016 Exercise Cygnus? I think they would have been background documents, but really my, my, my role in Cygnus uh, was uh, at, at the officials level, meeting with the CMOs and supporting the minister. So, so that was the kind of level I, I was working at. There may well have been further consideration, you know, further further into the system. There, there, were, there were officials groups meeting in Wales, as I recall, uh, and they would have certainly had access to all of those documents. After Exercise Cygnus, Milady's had evidence that the the NSCTHRC a ministerial committee in London in 2017 um, ordered the setting up of a pandemic flu readiness board in London and also one followed in Scotland. And um, are you aware of the extent to which or how the Welsh government responded to that direction from the NSC THRC in Wales? What body was set up by way of a pandemic flu preparedness group in Wales to deal with the aftermath of exercise sickness? So the pandemic flu readiness group at UK level um, was set up and Wales had a, um, an input into that, again through the HEPU, uh, was the prime, uh, uh, the prime relationship with, with Wales. And then uh, in 2017, um, an influenza pandemic Plan, uh, preparedness group was established again by the HEPU to, 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 to tie in to the, recommend, to the work streams, let's say, that were being run through the, the UK uh, group. So the same Wales pandemic flu preparedness group to which I refer, that is exactly. the body that responded in Wales? It is, yes. Could we have 107112, please? These are the minutes from the first meeting of the Wales pandemic flu preparedness group in September of 2017. And we can see that there are a number of attendees from the Welsh Government and Public Health Wales. And there is HEPU at the top, Health Emergency Planning Unit. Um, although I believe that HEPU formally is known as the Preparedness Unit. But in any event, maybe that's an earlier emanation. But we can see a number of officials from the Health and um, Social Services Group HSS, Public Health Wales, and apologies from three further officials. Further down the page, paragraph 1.4, an official, and, and um, the, the official, for your information, Sir Frank, is a, a senior member of HEPU, said that he'd called this group together to coordinate any outputs from the UK review structure and consider what may need to be undertaken in Wales to implement the review outcomes. So, so that is what you said a few moments mm -hmm. ago. The group was formed in order to consider what should be done in Wales. 1.5, the same official added that he thought there were a number of strategic documents that may need to be changed following the review, including the UK Pan Flu Framework 2011. That's our, our old friend mm -hmm. from 2011. The Local Resilience Forum Pandemic Flu Guidance. The Wales Response Plan the Wales Health and Social 
Service Pandemic Preparedness and Response Plan and the UK Wales Pan Flu Communication Strategy and the Operational Pandemic Flu Guidance relating to NHS and social care. Do you know the extent, Sir Frank, to which any or all of those documents did get updated in the fullness of time? Um, yeah, I don't think any of them were finally, uh, finally updated. I think that the whole process was to, uh, of the, uh, the UK process, was to update the, the suite of guidance. So the pandemic flu framework was being, and that was the pandemic flu plan, wasn't it, 2011? Yes. Uh, was, 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 was being um, updated through the group we just talked about. Um, th there was a, an expectation or a hope, I think, that the LRF pandemic flu guidance, which I think was 2013, was going to be led by, by Wales, uh, and, and, and the others um, uh, I don't think have been uh, updated since then. No. If you could turn, please, to page four and paragraph 7.1, we, we can see that the group decided that future meetings would be convened as and when substantial progress had been made at a board or work stream level. Is that a reference to, to the point that you've already made, which is, or you've made a few moments ago, which is that this committee or group decided that it couldn't progress the updating of the Welsh plans in these various areas unless and until the United Kingdom group had updated the United Kingdom plan, the 2011 strategy. Was that that's, the roadblock? Well, that's, that's my understanding. This, this group essentially was shadowing the UK preparedness group, yeah. But this group, Sir Frank, was convened in order to be able to progress civil contingency, emergency preparedness planning in Wales. What was the point of it convening at all if it was only ever going to do something once the United Kingdom had acted first? Well, it was, it was to provide input as well into that, into the UK process. So um, the, uh, the, the, the meeting of the group, you know, I think further up the, the minute there, um, talks about which members of the, uh, the Welsh Government were to be linked in to the various strands of UK preparedness. So it wasn't just waiting, it was actually looking to how we in Wales could support the overall development of pandemic preparedness. If you go up to 6.1, please, there's a reference to a strategic approach being applied. Members of the group should take the opportunity to look at the operational guidance currently in place and review whether revisions or new pieces of guidance would be needed following proposals from the Readiness Board. He added that he was taking a strategic approach to the task and any concept of operations developed would need to be reflected in Wales at a local level. What do you understand that reference to taking a strategic approach to mean? I don't, I don't really understand that at all, no. This was the position, wasn't it, that although that group was convened in order to progress Welsh civil contingencies work, none of the pieces of work that were identified as requiring updating, refreshment, whatever it, it, you call it, was done, even though some of it plainly included guidance that was Welsh only, so not just United Kingdom mm -hmm. documents or policy, but Welsh documents. None of it was done because the view appears to be taken that nothing should be done until the United Kingdom Pandemic Flu Readiness Board had acted first in relation to its own 2011 strategy. I think, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the subsequent actions were, were, were predicated on hanging off the revision of the 2011 plan strategy. Yeah. So the board, this group, did, decided it wouldn't convene again until further progress had been made at the UK level. Those are minutes from a meeting in September 2017. In January 2018, were you contacted by the United Kingdom Pandemic Flu Readiness Board and asked to agree to a meeting to see what progress was being made? Yes. And did that meeting not take place for a further six months until June of 18? I think that's correct. Could we have 180482, please?
senior officials meeting with Welsh Government DHSC and Cabinet Office, Cardiff, 14th of June. We can see that you are named as the first attendee from the Welsh Government. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kilpatrick, about whom we've heard and about whom we'll hear a little bit more in a moment, Director for Local Government, and David Goulding, to whom you've referred, Emergency Planning Advisor, a major constituent part of HEPU. And Ms. Hammond, from whom a lady has heard, Director, Civil Contingency Secretariat. Um, page two, please. An official asked whether any vulnerability mapping had been conducted as part of the sector resilience work. There was some discussion about challenge panels. DG, Mr. Goulding noted in the Welsh Government a group had been established to consider the outcomes of the UK review and to coordinate Wales' actions to implement any necessary changes in Welsh planning. So Mr Goulding makes reference to the point you've made, which is that nothing was going to be done until the United Kingdom had acted first. Mm -hmm. But what about documents which were only Welsh documents as opposed to United Kingdom documents? Did that approach affect guidance across the board in the field of pandemic planning? There was no document that could be, um, could be worked on and um, improved or updated because of this strategic approach. Well, I think the, the, the master document was, the, was seen and was always seen as the 2011 strategy, really. So I think, and this is just my recollection, that I think that uh, everything else was, was seen to be hinging on, on that. Having said that, you know, there the, the were groups um, through the... Um, the emergency planning advisory group that we talked about earlier, which were trying to progress the work on excess mortality, etc. Uh, so, so some of the work was continuing, but there was no um, updating of the overall strategy documents. That was all hinged on the 2011 strategy update. And the 2011 strategy itself hinged on whether or not the UK Pandemic Flu Readiness Board would have the resources or the inclination to do that first step of updating it itself, didn't it? I can't disagree with that. If you look at the second bullet point under products, the 2011 strategy refreshes a scheduled year two pandemic flu readiness board product. I think product there is a hmm. piece of jargon to me, meaning work. While a refresh of the 2013 local resilience forum guidance is needed, this is not currently scheduled in year two of the programme, primarily due to resource availability. In terms of timing, there would be limited benefit in refreshing it ahead of the strategy, given the cross-references needed between the two documents. So the UK Pandemic Flu Readiness Board was unable to get on with its own mm -hmm refresh of the 2011 strategy because it was for different reasons tied to another document which wasn't even going to be addressed until the following year because of resource problems. Mm -hmm. So following that meeting, what concern did you have that the entire process of bringing these important HCID and pandemic influenza Pan Wales documents up to date was being frustrated. Well, I think the, there was an exchange, a sort of exchange between the HEPU and uh, Civil Contingencies Group, and the note went to the Minister to, to advise that although progress was being made, it wasn't as fast as we had anticipated, and that there was a likely ask for additional resources, not least around the refresh of the 2013 LRF guidance, which, as I say, I think there was a, my, my recollection of the meeting was that there was an expectation that Wales was going to provide some leadership and some resource into uh, that particular piece of work. Um, so uh, so the, the, the note went up to the minister about that, yeah. But that expectation was never realised, was it? What expectation? The, the expectation that you've just referred to, which is that there will be LR, uh, local resilience forum guidance updated nevertheless. No, I think events kind of overtook things. Yes. Right. So that never happened either? It did not. Right. Could we have, please, 180484? This is the email string to which you've referred, Sir Frank. It's an email string from July 2018. It's going to be a bit difficult to find the relevant emails because it's all on a single page, but 
if our excellent technician can find his way down to the 6th of July 2018, which is probably two or three screenshots lower. Sixth of July, um, and then o four thirteen. So thirteen minutes past four in the afternoon. It'll be two or three further emails down. There we are. From Reg Kilpatrick to Frank Atherton, yourself and David Goulding, copying in Andrew Goodall, who was then the NHS Wales Chief Executive, but is now the Permanent Secretary. Was this an email? in which between you all, because you were all concerned with this issue, concern was being expressed about the fact that the review and the guidance was, was simply not being processed. If you look down at the third paragraph, Mr Kilpatrick said to you, given that this is a UK review, they, that's the United Kingdom government, are specifically for some resources to help in that task, which seems a reasonable request. In view of the total emergency planning capacity across NHS Wales, I would expect us to be more cooperative than we currently are. The pace of development of the review and guidance is therefore at risk, so this needs to be exposed to ministers along with resource issues. And it was brought to ministers, was it not? It, it was. Um, it was indeed, yeah. So that, that was the... the, the um, uh, this all refers to a minute of that meeting, which was being sent up, to, being prepared to be sent up to the minister. Yeah. And is and that Mr. Vaughan Getting, to whom we've referred earlier, who was then the cabinet secretary for health and social indeed, services? Yes. Yes. So this email correspondence was at official level, mm -hmm. where you were debating your concerns about the fact that there had been no progress, mm -hmm. and that there was an issue about resources, and a risk. <coughs> administratively or politically, yes. which needed to be brought to the attention of Mr Getting. Is that a fair summary? That is a fair summary, yes. The, the email string ends on the 10th of July, if we go back to the top of the page. Where you wrote this, after there had been quite a, quite a difficult debate between the, the three of you, Sir Frank, about um, what should be done. Um, I don't think we need to go into the, uh, the, the detail of, of what became quite, quite a personal debate further down the email chain. But you said, signal that we have reached a compromise. There is considerable work remaining. We need to deepen liaison with the Local Resilience Forum mechanism. But I'm assured we have good engagement with Department of Health on this. So your position was, <coughs> why don't we tell the minister that a compromise has been reached in terms of the extent to which the United Kingdom can call upon the Welsh official structure for assistance, but there is considerable work remaining on the Welsh side. We need to deepen liaison, but we've got good engagement. Is, is that a fair summary of what you were saying? Well, it partly is. The, the, the compromise was, was, dare I say, you know, between members of our team, really, was in Welsh government, because there was a something of a disagreement about the, the, the advice that we were giving to the minister. So um, there was a feeling from the civil contingency side, Reg Kilpatrick, that uh, the, the view we were giving to the minister in David Goulding's original uh, email uh, uh, message to the minister was unduly optimistic and that we weren't signalling sufficiently the need for additional resource, or the request that was coming from the UK government for additional Welsh resource, and where that resource would come from. So the compromise was uh, to change the, the advice that was going up, to make it much clearer to the Health Minister that those were, were salient issues. So presumably some advice or um, a message was sent to the Minister for Health. Mm -hmm. In the event, in the event uh, Sir Frank, is this the position, though, that f no further resources were, as far as you understood it, yes. committed to pandemic planning? The risk that you'd identified remained, which is that the Welsh Government would be exposed to the accusation that no further resources were being devoted to this issue. 
No further work was done in relation to any aspects of the Welsh pandemic planning guidance because of the roadblock in, as you saw it in London. And this particular body, which had been set up in order to progress work, the Wales Pandemic Flu Preparedness Group, met for the last time in September 2018 and didn't sit again. I, I agree with all of those, uh, those points. And, and of course, the reasoning behind that was that, the reason for that and for the progress then to stall was that resources were moved to other issues. Yes. It, it, is that a euphemistic reference to the impact of the necessary preparations for a no-deal EU exit? Or Operation Yellowhammer, if you like. Yes. So not only were no resources developed, not only did no work continue on the guidance, not only did the main committee dealing with this issue not sit again, but whatever work streams were being pursued were then interfered with by Operation Yellowhammer. Is that a fair summary? The work all stalled. So it's stalled for additional reasons. Yes. Mr Keith, it looks like we're not going to finish the Frank before the break. Uh, Milady, if that's a convenient... Um, that may well be a very convenient moment. But yes, I'm afraid that is the reality. Sorry, we're going to have to break off in the middle of the Mr Frank. Uh, I shall return at half past three. All right. So, Frank, in May 2018, according to your witness statement, you re-established a body known as the Health Protection Advisory Committee. And it had representatives from the Welsh Government, local health boards, Welsh local authorities, the Food Standards Agency, Public Health Wales, National Resources Wales, and, and a couple of other entities. It plainly covered a range of public health matters or was designed to cover a, mat a range of public health matters and not just influenza pandemic preparedness or even HCID preparedness. But why did you do that? Yeah. What need did you perceive was not being met in the absence of such a committee? Or what concerns did you have, if any, that led you to want to re-establish that committee? Yeah. So... Um... <laughs> There had been a committee, a health protection committee, previous to my taking up the role of CMO, and that was disestablished for reasons I don't really understand. But my desire with it was really to have a forum where we could look at the broad sweep of health protection issues, which affected a range of organisations. Um, uh, the, the reasoning for that was that health emergencies, health issues, health, health um, threats to health are so wide-ranging that you need to have a, a lot of different organisations involved and engaged. Um, so although I had very good contact with um, health counterparts and social care to some degree, uh, I didn't feel we had a strong enough input to local authorities, to, um, to Natural Resources Wales, to the Health and Safety Executive, to the Food Standards Agency. So I, I set the, the, the group up to bring together those groups. It was really a stakeholder group. Uh, to help to understand the threats and so that they could bring to the table and to my attention any threats from their particular domains as well. Does it follow, Sir Frank, that the, the need for that committee was born from the recognition that there was no other pre-existing committee which was, was convened, was being convened to address such threats or to look at those health protection issues? There was nothing looking across the broad sweep uh, that I've just described, yes. And in the course of the 18 months from May 18 to the onset of the yes. pandemic, did that Health Protection Advisory Group look at a number of threats or issues or matters of concern? It did, yes. One of the ones that we've noted was 
the, the areas in which hospital isolation facilities may have been deficient. I'm not going to ask you questions about that, but there was an issue about the improvement in compliance and what the substantive provision of facilities amounted to. But another important area which followed on from that was the issue of high consequence infectious disease outbreak control. Did you have a concern that the position in Wales, that the structure, that the personnel and the, the people and the systems for dealing with HCID, high consequence infectious disease outbreak, was deficient? Um. So they are, as you rightly say, two different things. The isolation rooms issue had gone back quite a long time, and I was uh, I, I had tried to, uh, to to make sure that in Wales we had sufficient uh, isolation room um, availability in all of our hospital stock, so that we could deal with uh, significant infections and to help to control um, uh, communicable diseases within hospitals. The the HCID issue, high consequence infectious disease issue. It came came to my attention particularly when we had cases of monkeypox, now mpox, and Ebola occurring in the UK, um, and it was clear to me that having high consequence infection units only in London and Newcastle, as I think existed at the time, we had a gap in Wales, and I felt that we ought to have some provision in Wales, and so we embarked on a process to develop uh, that provision as part of the UK network. What provision? The provision for dealing with high consequence infectious disease? Yes, exactly. Yes. But so there was no, or at least no adequate provision for the management of a high consequence infectious disease in Wales until you directed the committee which you re-established mm. to look at that issue? No, there was provision. The provision was predicated, though, on the use of uh, hospital, hospital beds in uh, London or in Newcastle. Uh, so any high consequence uh, infectious disease in Wales would have had to be transported to those places. And in fact... Just sorry, just pause there. Uh, there was in Wales, territorially, yes. no provision for the treatment of high consequence or the management of high consequence infectious disease. If you became infected in Wales with a high consequence infectious disease, your management, the treatment and the public health consequences would all be transferred across the border. Just to be clear, we, we, we're talking about very unusual infections, uh, Ebola infections, for example, where highly specialised contained um, facilities are required um, at a level that we did not have in Wales. We had, uh, we had and have the ability to treat most infectious disease, most outbreaks, etc. But HCIDS is a separate, it's a, a higher tier provision of service, which currently exists only in those two places I've mentioned. Uh, what we had done, of course, in Wales is to make sure that if we did have uh, such, a, such an, a case, if we had a case of Ebola, that we were able to identify it, isolate it, uh, the, the, the person who was affected and transport them safely to, uh, to, to one of those units. Um, uh, and we'd actually invested through the Welsh Ambulance Service in the arrangements to make that happen. But the arrangements were not adequate, were they? That is the concern that was expressed at the committee in which you set up. Uh, that's why I was concerned that we should have such an establishment in Wales, exactly. Yes. So it's no answer to say, well, it's all right, there were perfectly adequate arrangements in England to dealing with HCID. The committee became aware that, quote, we in Wales were not adu adequately prepared for such an incident. And that was a reference to two Welsh residents from Welsh West Wales who had been low-risk contacts of a, um, I, I suppose, a, a sort of ground zero, a, 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 the, the zero monkey pox case. Yeah. So, 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 so the Welsh system was unable even to deal with a case involving just two contacts from a monkey pox infection. But, well, I accept the point that, that it, was, it was the case that any, any high-consequence infectious disease that was identified in Wales... Uh, or indeed large swathes of England would have had to be treated in either London or Newcastle. <coughs> Those were the only two sites, and I felt it was important to establish that. That's not to say that the arrangements were, uh, were not there. There were arrangements, but I wanted to strengthen those arrangements. 
But the email thread between you and some of the officials on the committee, including Mr. Goulding, of the 31st of December 2019 says, it became clear that we were not adequately prepared for such an incident. So it wasn't a question of the committee saying, we are adequately prepared because we can make arrangements for contacts to be traced in England or for somebody infected with monkeypox to be treated or managed in England. The Welsh response was not adequate. Isn't that the reality? Well, it was adequate in, in that if we had somebody, we would we would we had the arrangements to get them to a HCID facility. Uh, that was that was that 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 would have solved the, the issue. That would have provided the support to that person. But it would be a better system, perhaps, perhaps a strengthened system might be a better way of putting it than an, than an, an inadequate system. Uh, we were trying to strengthen our system. Well, could we have, please, 177379 up, please, on page one? You can see that the email is addressed to David, so David Goulding. If you could just cast your eyes down, please, a page, Sir Frank, to the reference to monkeypox case. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in the context of how the system had been tested by recent events where two Welsh residents from West Wales who were low-risk contacts um, had come to the attention of the NHS, the planning meeting to confirm how we would respond to one or both residents becoming unwell, it, is, it became clear that we were not adequately prepared for such an incident. So this debate was not phrased in terms of, well, we're doing fine, but we could do even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, we were not adequately prepared. That, that's not the same, is it? Well, I, I accept your point, but you know, I, 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 perhaps it was an ine inelegant wording on my part. Uh, we could certainly have responded to those uh, patients because we would have, we had robust plans to get them to an HCID unit. What I perhaps should have said uh, is adequately uh, resourced to manage such an incident in Wales, which is what we were trying to set up. Well, let's have a look at the minutes. 177380. Please. At page three, at paragraph 4.2, there is a reference to an issue relating to care homes. Yes. Which paragraph, please? 4.2, CMO, is that you? That's me, yes. Express concerns about the preparedness of care homes, in particular the arrangements for antivirals. This was in the context of seasonal flu, was it not? It was, yes. So, in relation to seasonal flu, for which there is necessarily antiviral in existence and, and vaccines and a, and a national flu service, you were expressing concerns about the ability of care homes and the arrangements for antivirals in that limited context? Yes. Can I, can I expand on that, Please. lady? Would, would that help? So, in, in, in Wales, we do have uh, arrangements for provision of anti uh, antivirals into care homes when we have seasonal flu. Uh, it's rather a um, uh, laborious process in that it involves getting general practitioners involved, and uh, that is a, a real draw on their time. I had come across from Canada, where I'd been working in similar environments, but in Canada, we had a much more robust system, I, I felt, where uh, care homes had pre-authorisation pre to distribute antivirals on the say-so of a CMO or a medical officer. And it was a much, much more streamlined process. And I had discussed with ML uh, the, the, um, the bringing that, that process into Wales. So that's, that was the nature of the discussion at the HPAG meeting. Thank you. All right. That's care homes. In relation to infections, page four, paragraph 5.2, please. High consequence infections presentation, CMO, is, is that you? I think we'll establish that. Acknowledge that there were significant questions about the preparedness of NHS Wales to deal with a similar situation. What, 
one monkeypox case and two contacts, and to be able to manage an infected case at one of our acute hospitals for at least 24 hours. So you, you weren't saying there, it's all fine, may we please have more robust plans, which is the phrase you used a few moments ago, you acknowledged there were significant questions about the preparedness of NHS Wales, of the Welsh NHS, to deal with this limited case of a monkeypox infection. Purely, yeah, I, I accept the point absolutely, but it was because monkeypox was defined as a high-consequence infectious disease and we were not geared up to provide all the facilities needed, or the staffing, or the arrangements to provide uh, treatment for an HCID in Wales. And I felt that was a gap in our armaments which we, which we should uh, improve. And so, by contrast to the catastrophic consequences of COVID, which in essence is a highly infectious disease, just not terminologically a high consequence one, with catastrophic consequences, there wasn't just a gap, there was a yawning chasm in terms of preparedness. The Welsh NHS couldn't even deal with a single limited contact HCID case. Well, I think they're very different things. The, 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 if you remember, um, to go back to, at the start of the, uh, the pandemic, um, because we knew very little about uh, coronavirus, the, the novel coronavirus, it was, tr it was managed initially as a high-consequence infectious disease, and patients were transferred to London or Newcastle, the first few patients. Um, beyond that, of course, it, it became downgraded from a high-consequence infectious disease to a, a disease which should be able to be managed and could be managed within hospitals that had adequate infection control procedures and um, uh, normal hospital secondary and tertiary care uh, facilities. So, so there is a very significant difference between the one case of Ebola or monkeypox and the large number of flu cases, which we were absolutely geared up to deal with, or indeed subsequently of the coronavirus cases. So I accept your point that we were not adequately prepared for high consequence infectious diseases, which is why I raised it with the HPAG and uh, tried to, uh, to, to move that uh, to, and in fact we, we made some investment through the National Health Protection System to actually start to address that. What general concerns did the committee express about the absence of testing capacity in Wales and its current microbiology estate, that is to say, the structural, the system, for dealing with new testing technologies and testing diagnoses and frontline support? Well, I don't think the committee commented specifically on that. Remember, the committee was to give advice to me, but I had had discussions with Public Health Wales colleagues about our adequacy in those regards, and we'd sought some additional investment to try to strengthen, again, those processes in Wales. I think we sought uh, extra resources from the Minister in 2019, and then subsequently in 2020 when the pandemic hit. Could we have 177362, please? This was a paper prepared for the committee in July 2019, six months before the pandemic struck page one at paragraph four. The current microbiology infection services in Wales are fragile and are struggling to deliver on a day-to-day -day basis the prevention, early diagnosis and frontline support that professionals and the public require. Is that not a major concern? It was a major concern. That's why I was raising it so that we could get extra additional investment to address it. Was additional investment provided within the six months following this paper? I believe it was. Um, we, we, we provided, we, we, we put advice to the minister and the minister uh, provided some additional resources. We also moved some resources within Public Health Wales. So I think a, an additional 1.5 to 2 million pounds was invested in our laboratory capacity and in um, the, the workforce capacity to, to needed to deal with uh, major outbreaks and incidents. So, Frank, that money may well have been attributed, directed towards the fragile microbiology infection services in Wales. Mm -hmm. Were any additional testing processes or personnel for testing made available by the end of December 2019? 
well, I don't know about the recruitment process that went through, but certainly the, the funding was in 2019 was put in, was intended to improve the testing, specifically around genomic testing of pathogens. By the onset of the pandemic, the entire testing provision, the microbiological, the genomic, the diagnostic testing system in Wales remain fragile, as we can see here, did it not? There was a fragility that we had to address, and that's why in 2019 we tried to start to address that. Final questions, please. Um, in relation to inequalities, and, and appreciating, of course, that, that as the Chief Medical Officer of Wales, you, you, you are not the Minister for Health and Social Services. Can you recall any focus being paid at any time, uh, either in terms of the guidance or the policy documentation or, or the procedures uh, which, which came before you, upon the impact on those who suffer from societal or ethnic inequality of all this planning, other than in relation to the obvious point that mm. there will always be clinical risk mm. involved and, and, and obviously pandemics and disease outbreaks affect everybody differently mm -hmm. clinically. Mm -hmm. Can you recall any debate at all about a wider consideration of societal or ethnic inequality? So the, 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 the one I can recall there being quite a bit of discussion about was about how we, and this is not specific to pandemics, but how we, in any civil contingencies issue, whether it's flooding or flu or any, anything, how we kind of identify vulnerable people and uh, target resources towards those vulnerabilities. Um, so there had been quite a, a, a bit of work in Wales about how we map vulnerabilities and how we, and in fact, what transpired, as I recall from the discussions, was that there was every different organisation had different methods of doing it. And what I think we, where I think we landed was that there's a need for a common approach to vulnerability mapping of, of uh, vulnerable individuals and vulnerable groups in society who might need additional support uh, on top of the support you give through any, uh, any major incident. All right, thank you. Many of those are all my questions. Um, you've granted permission for a number of areas to be explored by the legal representative for COVID-19 brief, Amy Sir Justice Cumbry. Thank you. It's heaven. Thank you, my lady. So, Frank, I'm just over here, Hi. right of the pillar. Um, my name's Kirsten Heaven, and I represent the COVID-19 uh, Brief Families for Justice Cymru. I just want to explore two topics with you. The first one is a bit more, please, in relation to infection control. Obviously, you'll understand that this is a, a matter close to the heart of many of those whom I represent, particularly uh, in the context of those who contracted COVID-19 uh, and went on to die in the context of, of, of hospital-acquired infection. I first want to ask you um, in particular about a, a document. So can we bring up, please, INQ 30-145726? So if we just scroll down, we can see... So this is a document entitled Healthcare Associated Infections, a Strategy for Hospitals in Wales. And we can see it's a Welsh Assembly government document. Now, just to give you a bit of background, we know that this is a document from 2004. So clearly, it's a very long time before you come into post in 2016. But if we just look, if we just turn to the first page, please. We've got it on our screen. Have you? Sorry, yeah. it's not showing on my screen. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that this is, um, there's a forward here, and it's explaining that there's a healthcare-associated infection. Um, 
some patients will become infected as a major consequence of another illness. Um, and it's talking about a strategy being developed by the Welsh Healthcare Association Infection Subgroup of the Committee for the Control of Communicable Diseases. And essentially, it's setting out a, a strategy um, to be applied in local NHS trusts in Wales um, to essentially improve infection control in Welsh hospitals. Mm -hmm. First question, did that subgroup on the Committee for the Control of Communicable diseases. Did, did that exist in 2016, do you know? Um, I don't recall it. Uh, I don't recall a group of that name, but we did have various groups looking at um, healthcare associated uh, infections, yes. Okay. And if we just scroll down then briefly to internal page four. Do you have that there? Okay. Yep. Okay. So we can see there that uh, in the basic introduction, healthcare associated infections continue to cause substantial patient morbidity and cost to the health service. And it's explained in the second paragraph that uh, there's a reference there to an Improving Health Wales document from 2000, which is the essentially the inspiration for this document uh, in order setting out clinical tools for the management of infection control. So if we can turn then internally to page 25. Do you have that there? Um, I have a page. I can't tell what number it is, okay. but yes. So page 25, I, what, this is what I want to ask you about, is some lessons from the severe acute respiratory syndrome outbreak, paragraph 1.5. Oh. Do you see that there? Yeah. Okay. So what this document uh, essentially is saying is that some lessons needed to be learnt as a result of the SARS as outbreak in 2004. And I'm not going to read it all out because the inquiry has it there before them. Um, but what it makes clear is the SARS outbreak has thus provided us with a timely reminder that not only should sound and evidence-based infection control policies be in place, but considerable attention must be paid to ensuring that they are rigorously and consistently applied. And this requires sound understanding and commitment to effective infection prevention and control practice amongst staff in the healthcare system and the strategy focuses on the development of systems designed to achieve this objective. So that was the clear recommendation coming out in 2004, that there needed to be it, 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 systemic policies developed within infection control. Now, just fast forwarding then to 2014, you've been taken to the Wales' major framework for managing major infectious disease emergencies. So just to complete the picture, if we could get that document up, please. It's INQ three zeros. 184289 and it's page 13. So it's internal page 13. Now you've been asked in detail about uh, this document. I want to focus on the very last bullet point which says this. All hospitals need to establish ways of caring for large numbers of infectious patients on a scale outside their normal experience, including those requiring high dependency care. Can you see that there? Yes. yes. Yeah. So you've been asked about the adequacy of Wales' ability to, re to respond to one or two cases of a HCID. But in 2014, following on from the SARS recommendations, it, it was recognised, wasn't it, that there was a need for hospitals to deal with large numbers of infectious patients, not just one or two? That's certainly the case, and we see that every year, of course, with pandemic, with, with seasonal flu uh, outbreaks, indeed. So when you came in to your post in 2016, can you just assist the inquiry with what personal steps, if any, did you take um, to ascertain the state of infection control generally in Welsh hospitals? So... Um when I arrived um, quite early on, I, I actually chaired um, a group um, which was looking at antimicrobial resistance and also healthcare associated infections. Um, I co chaired that with one of the uh, medical directors from um, one of the local health boards. 
Uh, and that group was subsequently taken over by the Deputy Chief Medical Officer who was reporting to me. So we did have, through all of the time that I've been uh, the Chief Medical Officer, and continue to have a, a very strong focus, I would say, on HCAIs, uh, healthcare associated infections. Um, we, 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 we have the structures in place, uh, we have the guidance in place to hospitals as to what they should be doing around HCAIs and infection prevention. Um, we monitor that as Welsh Government, the Health and Social Service Group monitored it very carefully through. Uh, the monthly returns uh, from, from health boards and from through a, a, a process called the JET, that's the Joint Executive Team Meetings, where we meet with the executive of each health board twice a year, uh, to, 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 and, and we look at well, a range of issues, but including uh, infection control issues. Um, and it's why I, in 2016, when I saw the, the, the lack of... Um, uh, total provision of infection control um, isolation rooms across Wales, why I personally put so much time and effort into trying to get the resources to be able to make sure that every hospital and every health facility had the ability to, to deal with those. But more fundamentally, um, I, I, I was regularly in contact with, uh, in common with my colleague, the Chief Nursing Officer at the time, and we, we, we wrote repeatedly, I think, to, uh, to, to chief nurses, to medical directors, reminding them of their responsibilities. Uh, and we actually established, I think it was in 20, I can't remember which year, but we, we, we established a, a workshop, probably it was early 2019, actually, to, to look at the issue of uh, um, uh, HCAI and, and our health protection system and that what led to the investment that we've just been talking about with Mr Keith. So, you know, you ask what personally I've done. I think I've tried very hard to make sure that HCAI remains an important consideration within the health system and that we have the ability to, to deal with it. But we've seen that the recommendation in 2004 was in relation to SARS. That was a HCID, wasn't it? It would have yep. been an HCID, yes. Yet it, it was only in 2019 that you were raising concerns in relation to monkeypox, another HCID. Yeah. Uh, so Quite a delay, wasn't it? Well, um, I'm talking about the, 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 the generality of infection control in hospitals, and that's a really important issue, and I thought that's what you were referring to. But if your point is that we didn't have an HCID facility in Wales until... Uh, um, you know, up until 2019, that is, that is a correct, correct. But we did have, of course, as I've previously outlined, arrangements for patients with HCIDs to be uh, safely transferred to English facilities for treatment. Just one final point in relation to nerve tag, please. You've just explained a moment ago that um, Wales didn't have a role in nerve tag. I think we understand from the evidence that we're likely to hear from Andrew Goodhall that Wales played an observer status. Um, we can see in documents in 2016, Nerve Tag are making recommendations about the need for FFP3 P3 masks and more general masks to be available in all hospitals, communities and ambulance and social care staff services. In 2016 and onwards, were you personally aware then of the recommendations that were being made by Nerve Tag, in particular in relation to masks that I've just described? Well, I, I don't recall seeing that recommendation. I'd have to have a look at it. But, but don't you need to know, uh, in your role as a CMO, if Nerve Tag are making recommendations? Isn't that something you need to know? Uh, I, w I would expect to have been informed of that, and I would expect that uh, the systems in Wales would have picked that up and would, would know about that. As to whether we were a member or had observer status, I, 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 I can't recall. That there were some of the, the groups in, in the UK, we had observer status, and it may well be the case that we did have observer status in, in Nerve Tag, in which case, my lady, I apologise for my earlier statement, but we can, we can check that. But to be clear, you never te attended a Nerve Tag meeting directly I did, yourself? I did not, no. no. Thank you very much, my lady. Thank you, Ms. Heaven. One question from me, Sir Frank. You described almost at the very beginning of your evidence that um, the office of the chief medical officer when you first started sounded like it was pretty under-resourced. Yes. It got the resources when we, when, you went into, when we went into the pandemic. So what did it go from to? Well, essentially, my lady, um, 
I had secretarial support and personal administration support, for, you know. Um, but what transpired at the start of the pandemic is um, things ha moved very, very quickly, and um, we very rapidly realised that we were drowning under the sea of information. We couldn't manage the information flows, couldn't even manage the emails, and so that led to a process over a period of time with me working with the Director General who you're about to speak to, uh, to to try to get some additional resource. So that, that was the process we went through. So basically the getting the additional resource was an acknowledgement that you were under-resourced in the first place? I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Milady, may I just correct one matter, which is that um, I put to Sir Frank that we had not received the Health and Social Services Group Risk Register that the Welsh Government has kindly informed us that they did provide it, in fact, last Thursday. But I re regret to say that it didn't pop out at the far end of the material provider disclosure process in time for um, and for Mr Sharma and myself to be able to be aware of it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your help, Sir Frank. Thank you, Mary. I should have said Malen for in respect of not Mr Sharma. So, Milady, the next witness is Dr. Andrew Goodall, the Permanent Secretary to the Welsh Government. Good afternoon. Could you give the inquiry, please, your full name? Uh, my name is Andrew Goodall. Dr Goodall, could you remember to, to keep your voice up as you give evidence, please, for our purposes and also for our hard-working stenographer? I believe my lady will be sitting till, till shortly before 5 o'clock, so there won't be a break this afternoon, um, of which you can take advantage, but there may be tomorrow. Um, you will, I'm afraid, be giving evidence tomorrow morning as well. It's impossible to conclude your evidence tonight. You've provided three witness statements, have you not? Variously dated the 14th of March 23, the 20th of April 23, and the 20th of April 23? Yes, I have. I think it's fair to say, Dr Goodall, you've strained every sinew to provide us with as much information as you can about the workings of the Welsh Government. But each of those statements is true, is it not? And, and you've appended your signature to each of them? Uh, it is true, and I've appended my signature. Thank you. You are currently the permanent secretary, the sole permanent secretary to the Welsh Government, are you not? Uh, I am. I took up that post in November 2021. Before that, were you Director General of Health and Social Services, and therefore also the Chief Executive of NHS Wales, posts which you held between June 2014 and November 2021. Uh, yes, that's correct, and I was discharging that role uh, during this particular period, yes. Which is why, of course, um, the, the previous witness, Frank Atherton, referred to you in the run-up to the pandemic as being the Director General of Health and Social Services. Indeed, that's correct. Could we start, please, with um, a crash course in Welsh constitutional matters and the role of the Welsh Parliament, formerly the National Assembly for Wales, uh, the role of the Welsh Government, formerly the Assembly Government, and where health, public health and civil contingencies come in the devolved nature of things. So there was under the Government of Wales Act 1998 a National Assembly for Wales established. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And within that National Assembly, was there an executive known as a cabinet or an executive committee, which comprised 
members of the Assembly. Uh, yes, that's correct. In 1999, a broad range of functions previously exercised by Ministers of the Crown for the United Kingdom in London were transferred by way of a series of orders in Council to the Executive, the Cabinet or the Executive Committee in Wales. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And, and were they the transfer of functions order or orders of 1999 and following? Uh, yes, they were. The... In 2014, under the Wales Act, did the name of the Welsh Assembly Government become changed or get changed to the Welsh Government? Uh, yes, it did. It changed to Welsh Government. And in 2020, did the name of the National Assembly for Wales change to the Senate or Welsh Parliament? Uh, yes, those changes happened in 2020. So, over the course of time, the nomenclature as well as the functions of the Cabinet or the Executive Committee, in essence the Welsh Government, have changed quite considerably, have they not? Uh, yes, indeed, they, they have changed significantly, uh, in particular when the opportunity to be able to make its own legislation came through. And was that because um, until the Government of Wales Act 2006, the National Assembly for Wales was unable to make its own primary legislation. Yes, that's correct. And so the current position is this, that in the Welsh Government there is a First Minister who leads the Welsh Government, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And there are a number of Welsh Ministers equivalent to what one might, what one might call senior Ministers in the United Kingdom Government in London and Deputy Welsh Ministers equivalent to junior ministers in the UK government? Uh, yes, that's correct. Their, their names have changed over the years, but broadly uh, it, it would be the same, yes. And there is at the apex of the administration of the Welsh government a permanent secretary, and that is you. Yeah, yes, I lead and manage the civil service, yes. So you're, I suppose one might, might, might call the equivalent amalgamation, perhaps, of Head of the Civil Service in Wales, the Cabinet Secretary, the Administrative Chief Executive. You are the Permanent Secretary who is subject only to ministerial control. Yes, that would be true of my successors, myself from 2021, of course. And yes, uh, my role would include acting as the Principal Accounting Officer for the organisation and also acting as the First Advisor to, um, to the First Minister and the Cabinet as well. We've seen from the relevant paperwork that Wales does not have ministries. It has, for the purposes of carrying out its functions, a number of departments known as directorates. Yes. Is that why we've seen, of course, in the context of health emergencies, repeated references to the Health and Social Services Directorate? Uh, indeed, Health and Social Services Group, um, uh, and I was the Director General of that group. Indeed, until you became the Permanent Secretary. In your witness statement, one of your witness statements, you, you say this, despite the range of responsibilities, the Welsh Government is, and in my experience always has been, a compact administration. Welsh ministers and senior officials are under one roof and frequently in the same room together. What consequences have flowed from that Dr Goodall, in terms of the way in which the Welsh Government has been able, historically, to make decisions? Um, as I've experienced it uh, through this particular period, but of course subsequently as well, um, I think it allows for a closer contact amongst both officials and also uh, amongst ministers. It means that irrespective of working in an individual portfolio, for example in health, uh, you have an awareness of the broader workings of government, including on other policy matters. Um, I think it does create a network of confidence and trust. Colleagues get to know each other and it also extends out beyond just the workings within the Welsh Government because it translates into the way in which we work across other agencies and other networks in Wales as well. So there is a, an intimacy about that system internally for Welsh Government as well as outside. Dr Goodall, 
you speak very fast, and I didn't, in fact, ask you at the beginning to, to speak more slowly or to ensure that you speak slowly. Could you please do so, however? Of course. It's very difficult for the, um, the, 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 the very skilled stenographer to keep up with that level of, of, of speech. Just to identify the major moving parts at the highest level of the Welsh Government, is there a, a Welsh Government board which provides strategic advice and assurance to you, the Permanent Secretary? Uh, yes, I would distinguish um, its role aside, of course, from the Cabinet and the political oversight, which also will oversee the delivery of civil service priorities in Wales. But the Welsh Government board has a role to help me discharge my principal accounting officer role. Um, it provides assurance. It helps us with the outlook and the strategic direction of the organisation. Uh, in simple terms, it allows me to lead and manage the organisation. And do you also have the benefit of an executive committee, which is a both an operational and strategic decision-making body within the civil service in Wales, no doubt staffed by heads of the directorates and, and other officials and, and chaired by you? Uh, yes, we have an executive committee. I chair it and that really acts as the decision-making mechanism for the civil service. And finally, it, is there, and this will become relevant later, something called ARAC, A-R-A-C, the, the Audit Risk Assurance Committee, which assists you to, to discharge the functions to which you made reference a moment or two ago as the principal accounting officer to the Senate. You are responsible to the Senate as the principal accounting officer for the entirety of the Welsh non-ministerial administration. Yes, the Audit and Risk Committee um, supports, the, again, the discharge of uh, the risk areas in the organisation, the annual accounts process, and brings together non-executive members alongside directors and officials in the organisation. Devolution. The inquiry is now very familiar with the distinction between devolved and reserved matters. Are health services in Wales almost entirely devolved, which means that they are within the responsibility of the Welsh ministers and the Welsh civil service? Yeah, yes, they are almost entirely uh, devolved. I would describe them as devolved. There are some exceptions around some specialist areas which will occur on a UK basis, but yes, they are devolved responsibilities. By contrast, at the beginning, civil contingencies were not all devolved, were they? Uh, no, they weren't all devolved. Um, clearly, there were Welsh responses um, from first responders through to government, but they weren't all devolved responsibilities at the time, back at 2004. And that is a reference, isn't it, to the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004 of that year, because that was a single legislative framework, or provided for a single legislative framework for both England and Wales, <coughs> along with the statute itself, the provisions in the statute, and also the statutory and non-statutory guidance, which was produced alongside the Act. Yes, that's correct. And it also gave us uh, equivalents around support arrangements like local resilience fora. And historically, under that Act, were a number of regulations made by way of secondary legislation which applied to both England and Wales? Uh, yes, they were. In the fullness of time, however, and following a number of reports into civil contingencies in Wales, and notably a commission on devolution in Wales, the Silk Commission in 2014. Was there a major change in 2018, primarily through the Welsh Minister's Transfer of Functions order, which gave, at least for the pur purposes of the first part of the Civil Contingencies Act, part one, the 2004 Act, powers exclusively by way of devolved matters to the Welsh Government? Yes, whilst it left part two arrangements still at the UK level, um, those were the arrangements that came over for part one in 2018 and reflected um, 
a lot of support to want to be able to transfer over those functions very clearly into Wales um, because of the previous arrangements um, probably had Welsh Government acting in a de facto leadership function and role, but actually the legislation was able to make that very clear. By that, do you mean that from 2010 onwards to, and, and until 2018, the Welsh Government appreciated that because it was the government on the ground, so to speak, dealing with public health, dealing with local emergencies, because of course they arose locally, it had to take up the role of, of acting de facto as a responder under the Civil Contingencies Act, even though that was a piece of UK legislation, and even though it wasn't formally a devolved matter. Uh, yes, it would have a coordination and support role, um, but because of its discharge of devolved responsibilities through ministers, it needed to have clarity on its involvement. Um, in many respects, a lot of that leadership had been discharged in the Wales Resilience Fora from at least 2003. So Welsh Government was trying to ensure that it was able to give that coordination role. But again, we needed to make sure that the powers were much clearer, which is what happened in 2018. Could we look, please, just at one of those reports to which I've referred, the reports on civil contingencies which preceded the transfer of, of, of functions order? It, it's a report dated the 6th of December 2012, 107-113. And perhaps we could pick it up at page four, please. Dr. Goodall, I'm putting this page to you because although this is dated the 6th of December 2012, over 10 years ago, I'm going to suggest in due course that some of the problems and concerns identified back then are still relevant to this inquiry's consideration of the run-up to the pandemic, even though this report was prepared at a time when the Welsh Government had, <coughs> pre-transfer of devolved functions, a very different role. The recommendations were these. Many of the arrangements to deliver the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 work well, but the role of the Welsh Government is unclear, and there are opportunities for increased efficiency in local delivery. Complex leadership arrangements have not prevented the Welsh Government from providing effective support for partners delivering the Civil Contingencies Act 2004. Is that the de facto role to which you've referred? Uh, yes, that's uh, what I would have been describing. But too many emergency planning groups and unclear accountabilities add inefficiency to the already complex resilience framework. Could I perhaps go straight to the heart of the line of questioning which I will develop over the next two or three hours and ask you this, which is, do you believe, looking back, that that problem identified in 2012 was adequately addressed? By 2020, had that inefficiency and over-complexity been rooted out of the Welsh civil contingency structures, or do you think they remained? Uh, I think we had addressed that in part in terms of allowing the Welsh Government role to be much clearer, um, particularly where ministers would have expectations to oversee public services and discharge their responsibilities. Um, I think that there is an inevitable complexity about bringing agencies around the table um, who have a series of different reporting arrangements up and through to UK departments, there are non-devolved responsibilities, for example, the police. Um, and I don't feel that any of that has got in the way of creating partnerships and relationships in Wales. But um, in simple terms, we rely on an emergency response that is driven from a Wales Resilience Forum structure and is supported by four local Resilience Forum areas. I think the complexity, of course, is every first responder having their own statutory responsibility, which means 22 local authorities, four police forces, 10 health organisations. 
and I think that probably does start to steer some of the difficulties. But I think we at least were able to address an understanding of Welsh Government's role. Um, but I do think that some of the supporting arrangements in place up through local resilience for arrangements would still need to have been worked through. Your answer appears to address primarily the the arrangements at local level, the local resilience forums and the strategic coordinating groups and the resilience partnerships and so on. But is that, isn't that conclusion on, on that page of more general application, that there are too many emergency planning groups and unclear accountabilities in the resilience framework, so across the board, so not just at local forum and strategic coordinating group level, but within what has now become a, a, a more crystallised part of the Welsh Government? I think there are arrangements that work differently when planning and preparing, which turn into something different in a response mode. So I would say that we need to have an understanding of the difference between those two areas. Um, I think that um, some of the individual points of working arrangements that take place and some of the detailed level of work has inevitably need, needed a level of expertise and experience to be applied. So I would have some concerns about the range of subgroups that can appear, that can be used constructively, but we would have needed to have made sure they had a task and finish focus rather than just become an embed embedded part of our machinery. Um, I think the interrelationship between the use of different frameworks and plans at different times, for me, would be an issue. Um, we actually had tidied up some of those arrangements even back, I think, in around 2012, um, because the infectious disease framework, as an example, was an amalgam of four previous plans. <coughs> but nevertheless, I think that the interrelationship between uh, pandemic health and social services responsiveness and preparedness guidance alongside the infectious disease plan, alongside the Pan Wales response plan. We still, I think, need to make very clear about what parts of those are working at which moments. And certainly, in my own understanding, just to help with the clarity of the issue, it's the Pan Wales response plan, which is the overall coordinating and guiding hand, if you like, on the arrangements in Wales. Dr Goodall. The paperwork demonstrates that there are a plethora of different bodies from the Wales, Wales Resilience Forum, the Welsh Resilience Partnership Team, the Civil Contingencies Group, the Welsh Civil Contingencies Committee, the Resilience Steering Group, STAC, the Tactical Advisory Group, uh, CEL, the Tactical Advisory Group, the Emergency Coordination Centre, the Civil Contingencies and Incident Re Response Room, the Joint Emergency Services Group, HEPU, to which we've just had some evidence directed. You have the Pan Wales response plan. There are a multitude of guidance documents. There was a swine flu, a Wales pandemic influenza response arrangement, swine flu task and finish group, a Wales pandemic flu task and finish group. Wales Pandemic Flu Preparedness Group. I haven't covered them all. For, for, for an administration which prides itself on its efficiency of movement because of the, the, the relative lack of scale and, and an administration that operates effectively under one roof, are, are there not, in fact, a plethora of, of bodies in this labyrinthine system? There are many bodies. I think some of those relationships are probably clearer to me about how they would work. I think some of them would feel as though that they were um, duplicating some of the tasks and activities, and certainly the balance of what is discharged nationally as opposed to what is discharged within those sort of local responders and in the regional arrangements of the local resilience forum would also be an issue. But yes, that's a very significant list of areas, and looking forward, in our safe and secure Wales, of course, we need to make sure that that is very explicitly set out, that it is clear and it is also efficient. Um, 
What I also don't want to lose within our assessment, though, is the times when we do need to, of course, deal with issues at a matter of detail. But again, as I said earlier, I think that needs to be a philosophy of task and finish rather than ongoing arrangements. Sorry, I don't follow task and finish. I think I do. Yeah. T task and finish groups, really, just to make sure that uh, they quickly handle an issue. Um, they may have a cycle of two or three meetings with experience and expertise around the table, uh, and then come up with a solution which can be implemented uh, rather than an ongoing set of meetings. So it's a response? Uh, a response. So as an example, um, if one is working through a response about um, excess deaths in the context of pandemic flu to ensure that there is a time scale that is given in order to achieve those and deliver them and not just be an ongoing contact point between those experts. Task and finish. Following swine flu, the Wales Resilience Partnership team agreed that a Wales pandemic flu task and finish group be established, correct? Yes. Following exercise Cygnus, the Welsh Resilience Partnership team delegated overall responsibility to the Wales Pandemic Flu Preparedness Group. And following exercise Cygnus, the Pandemic Flu Readiness Board was promulgated, instituted for the purposes of making sure that, that those recommendations were identified and finished. But would you agree that despite those three instances of task and finish functions being identified, not all the recommendations from any of those reviews or exercises were in the event implemented? Uh, not all of those were implemented. So, And those committees, those task and finish bodies, took in some cases a very long time to attempt to ensure that the relevant recommendations were implemented, did they not? Uh, in my view, they, they took too long to yes. make sure that the recommendations were implemented, even if there had been progress on some of those activities and matters and they were completed. And so despite your recourse to the benefit of task and finish bodies, history and the reality have shown that they themselves have not really performed terribly well, have they? They um, haven't been able to discharge the outcomes on all of those areas, and we need to understand how, if we have got to a better place, that we need to be able to update the guidance at that point rather than try to keep searching. Please may we not have a terminological debate. They have not done very well, have they? The, the task and finish groups did not deliver all of the objectives. They didn't achieve them, no, I agree. They all were right. given the task, but they didn't finish. They, they didn't achieve all of the tasks, my lady, yes. Rather defeats the purpose of a task and finish group, does it not? Could we go back to... 107113, please. Page 9. Paragraph 13. This is the paragraph which underpins that conclusion, which is in red at the top of the page, which I read out from the index page that the role of the Welsh Government was unclear and there were opportunities for increased efficiency in local delivery. So, in 2012, one of the concerns expressed in this Welsh Audit Office report concerning civil emergencies in Wales was that there was a distinct need for increased efficiency in local delivery, that is to say, in the practical application of civil contingencies arrangements, and that there was a confusion about the role of the Welsh Government. And I asked you what your view was on this a little earlier, but we've now had the debate about the task and finish committees. Would you now perhaps reassess that some of the problems identified in this report from 2012 continued 
right up until the, the onset of the pandemic, because the committee process, the group process, the structures in the Welsh Government continued to be in significant respect inefficient. Uh, yes, I would agree with you that um, there were too many arrangements in place at that time that may have changed our focus uh, and what was needed. Um, as I said earlier, I do think that some of those mechanisms occur because of preparedness as opposed to um, the response itself. But uh, yes, I would agree that there is an ongoing need to make sure that we can have a less complex system. Yes. Thank you. Page 10, paragraph 17 and 18. Too many emergency planning groups and unclear accountabilities add inefficiency to the already complex resilience framework. That's the, 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 the summary I read out earlier. And paragraph 17 generally says the current structures leading to inefficiencies at a local level, unnecessary complexity and unclear accountabilities. And at 18, complex reporting arrangements are leading to confusion about the roles and responsibilities of the numerous emergency planning groups and organizations. The complexity risks fragmentation of resilience activity with potential overlaps or gaps in the arrangements for resilience. That is a astute and precise summary, is it not, of the Welsh Government civil contingencies arrangements between 2012 up to the time of the pandemic? Um, I believe we had addressed some of that complexity, but to take your point, um, I do agree that we have had too many examples of um, duplication and uh, activities happening. Even as we adopted the Welsh Government responsibilities in 2018, we have probably still not worked our way through the implications of that transfer of responsibilities by the time we take the pandemic as well. In essence, the Welsh Government was faced with, with, a, with a very complex strategic conundrum, which was having been given a multitude of what had then been, what up to then been reserved functions by virtue of the transfer of functions order in 2018, somehow those new responsibilities had to be discharged. And that, of course, required a great deal of thought to be given to the best way of setting up the system, the committees, the groups, the entities, the responders, and so on, to be able to do those new functions. Indeed, that's correct. And we had just in 2018 started to do some of the resilience assurance within the system in Wales at that point, um, but were unable to continue with that as a cycle as we'd originally intended. But that was very all in, in the transfer of the responsibilities. And as a result of inevitably with all governments resource issues, as a result of the diversion of attention away from civil contingencies planning to the consequences of a no-deal EU exit and, of course, the impact of the catastrophic pandemic, work was never allowed to get very far. Uh, yes, we um, haven't yet passed regulations that would discharge those part one responsibilities uh, as an example, but certainly, as you say, the EU exit arrangements um, ended up being a priority over and above some of the underlying resilience activities. Uh, that's correct. May we now then look at some of the bodies and, and, and see to what extent that proposition in that paragraph was justified in terms of unnecessary overlap and, at the same time, gaps. The, the first body to which you refer, or the first um, part of the Welsh Government to which you refer in your statement, which is the Welsh Government Resilience Team. Could we have, please, the organogram at page 10. Somewhere Ah, yes, middle of, mid, uh, on the far left of the page, please, of, of the diagram, halfway down, Welsh Government Resilience Team. Although on this representative 
diagram, the Welsh Government Resilience Team is, is shown as being outside the Welsh Government box, the, the, the First Minister's box in the middle of the page and, and the Directorate for Health and Social Services. The Welsh Government Resilience Team is, we presume, within the Welsh Government. It is within the Welsh Government and it helps the Wales Resilience Forum to coordinate its role and works with the other agencies in Wales. Is it within a directorate within the Welsh Government or is it a self-standing separate entity? It's uh, not self-standing, it's uh, within one of our directorate structures. W was it originally located within the Community Safety Division in the Human Resources Group but then transferred to the Community Safety Division in Local Government, then moved to Education and Public Services? Uh, yes, that's correct. It stayed uh, uh, in consistent arrangements linked to the Local Government roles in particular. Yeah. Is it going to stay where it is now, or might it move again, Dr Goodall? Um, though that team, um, including an expansion of that team as well, is still currently located within the same Director General arrangements and is still associated around those public services and local government areas. Do you think it likely that it will remain in the Education and Public Services group and then within the sub-Community Safety Division, or, or is it going to move again? Uh, it, it will be staying within those group arrangements. All right. There is evidence before my lady that that resilience team uh, attempted to procure, or at least the Welsh Government attempted to procure additional resources and funding from the United Kingdom Government in order to better enable the Welsh Government to discharge those functions which were transferred, formerly being reserve functions, to the Welsh Government under the Transfer of Functions Order 2018. Are you aware of whether or not those requests for further resources and funding to deal with these additional issues were successful? Uh, the transfer of responsibilities happened, but there was no funding that came across with those responsibilities from UK Government. So we had to review those arrangements ourselves at the time. Um, I believe there's a witness statement before my lady from Mr Kilpatrick, who is a senior official in the Welsh Government, um, in, in which he compares unfavourably the amount of funding and the staffing levels for the Welsh Government Resilience Team to the analogous organisation in the Scottish Government. Does the Welsh Government acknowledge that that resilience team is, even by the standards of pre-pandemic and, and post-pandemic civil contingencies planning, under-resourced and undermanned? Uh, it was under-resourced at the time and it expanded and it has continued to expand, but there are lots of examples in our discharge of our responsibilities in Welsh Government where, irrespective of having a wide range of responsibilities, we still, however, rem remain a compact organisation. So uh, I know at the time we did expand the resources for that team. They have subsequently been expanded on the back of experiences, including, of course, during the pandemic itself. I believe that in 2022, a new directorate was formed within the Welsh Government called the Risk, Resilience and Community Safety Directorate. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Are all resilience functions in the Welsh Government now within that single directorate for the better purposes of transparency and accountability, or are they still diffusely arranged across a broad spectrum of the government? Um, they are mainly located there, but it doesn't remove the individual responsibilities that are held by ministers and also by directors general for other sectors across Wales. But as an example, the Health Emergency Planning Unit would still be sat within the health structures as part of supporting the coordination of those responses. But that unit has expanded to include areas like cybersecurity response and does act now as the sort of expert facility within the organisation. So there is now a primary risk and resilience directorate within the Welsh Government so that everybody may know that that is the directorate in charge generally of civil contingencies, but in the context of health emergencies and civil <laughs> contingencies, 
plainly there needs to be another body dealing with health resilience and emergency planning, and that is elsewhere in the Welsh Government. Yes, we um, line manage the NHS in Wales, and it would form part of those responsibilities. But of course, there would need to be you know, very close liaison and coordination in the Welsh Government context. There is in Wales a Wales Resilience Forum, which was created in 2003, and I, I think, at least at some stage, chaired by the First Minister, and made up of senior leaders or partners in the civil contingencies field in Wales, similar to what we've heard is the Scottish Resilience Partnership. Does that Wales Resilience Forum, which is obviously a wider body, still function? Uh, it does still function, uh, whilst there may on occasion be deputising arrangements for the First Minister. In my experience, the First Minister has been the lead minister for that arrangement and has been a routine mechanism for meetings and discussions in Wales um, in preparedness and planning mode. Our uh, genius technician has, has flagged up Wells Resilience Forum on the screen. Does that body give direction to another body called the Wales Resilience Forum? Uh, sorry, does the Wales Resilience Forum give strategic direction to what is known as the Welsh Resilience Partnership Team? Uh, the Wales Resilience Partnership Team uh, are there to support the function of the Wales Resilience Forum. So it's where the civil servants are located who will act as the secretariat and who will oversee the arrangements by linking out with the wider system in Wales. Can't it just be a single body, Dr Goodall? Uh, the Wales Resilience the Forum. Forum and the Wales Resilience Partnership Team, if that is simply the operational mirror of the strategic forum, um, uh, do there have to be two separate bodies? The Wales Resilient Forum is a, is a meeting uh, which is supported by the team, so it discharges a range of responsibilities, but it, that is just the supporting team, but they do have a, a role beyond the Secretariat. They, of course, act to link out to partners and agencies in Wales as well. What then is the Wales Civil Contingencies Committee on the top right? The Civil Contingencies Committee um, will actually meet um, in the early phase of an emergency response, uh, rather than being chaired by the First Minister or um, a designated minister. It will be chaired by a senior official, um, and that allows uh, it to understand its responsibilities within a response phase of a major incident or an emergency planning issue. So what's the difference between a civil contingencies group, which is the box in the middle of the yellow box in the middle, and the Wales Civil Contingencies Committee. The Civil Contingencies Group uh, establishes itself in the early stages of an emergency response. The Wales Civil Contingencies Committee is when the triggers have been identified and when we are moving into a proper emergency response. And it acts as a liaison point with Cabinet Office and the UK government arrangements, including where needed um, to give advice up to the COBRA arrangements, of course. What then is Resilience Steering Group, which we may or may not have? The Resilience Steering Group on the is, chart is is just a, a smaller subset of colleagues, um, because the Wales Civil Contingencies Committee inevitably involves a range of agencies and other colleagues around the table. It's just a, a small interface that allows the activities from that group just to be taken up to support some of the liaison as well. So the Wales Civil Contingencies Committee is a wider group of colleagues who act to give advice when we are in response mode. Coming back to what you said earlier about the, the, the I don't know, the doctrinal or, or, or theoretical difference between preparedness and response, is this duplication of bodies in part the result of, of, of a need to be seen to be having a separate committee that deals with preparedness than that which deals with response? I mean, generally the approach Malady, is to this say... this is the, the point that you'll recall uh, Mr Mann and Professor Alexander um, addressed what now seems some time ago. Yes, indeed. Uh, for example, the Wales Resilience Forum um, didn't have a role to discharge within the pandemic response because it was there to prepare and to bring agencies together under the auspices of the First Minister. Uh, but yes, it's to separate out the preparedness 
from the response arrangements that are operationally occurring at the time. There is, in the bottom left-hand corner, a body known as Scientific and Technical Advice Cell, STAC. Are you familiar with that body? Yes. And we believe that was set up, or at least radically changed, in July 2019. Why, why was that? Uh, just to try and ensure that um, whilst needing to rely on, of course, uh, advice, uh, science and advice and use the networks at the UK level, that there may well be areas and there were experiences that showed that there was a need to translate advice directly into the Welsh context. That wouldn't necessarily happen in every arrangement, but on the basis of the emergency that was under consideration, there may be the need to draw in some more specialist advice at that time, which is when those arrangements came into play. But Dr Goodall, we've heard evidence already this afternoon from Sir Frank Atherton, the CMO, who pointed out to me lady that there is already a Chief Scientific Advisor for Wales, a Chief Scientific Officer of NHS Wales, a Chief Scientific Advisor Health within the Health and Social Services Group. Wales has the benefit of NERVTAG, any learning that comes from SAGE. Why was there a need for yet, yet another body? To make sure that those experiences could be brought to bear and it would also allow us to use those science experts within Welsh Government as well. So it was just a connecting point, not on every occasion or for every emergency, but when needed. But it has a secretariat, it requires funding, it requires people to fill the posts on that cell and has it not in fact also transmogrified over time because there is now a tactical advice cell and a tactical advice group both born from and have they, having their genesis in the scientific and technical advice cell. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, the technical advice uh, cell that was introduced basically is in line with that particular mechanism and was able to discharge advice and support for the areas that were under consideration in Wales during the pandemic response. And yes, it did bring to bear that sort of closer understanding of modelling data and evidence in the Welsh context and in the context of discharging devolved responsibilities. But Wales attends SAGE, so why wasn't SAGE and NERVTAG together sufficient? And if it wasn't, why wasn't STAC sufficient? Why was there a need to have yet a third level of new bodies, the, the Technical Advisory Cell TAC and the Technical Advisory Group, in order to provide a forum for scientific and technical advice, which was already being provided by Welsh Government advisors and available from UK entities. Um, so Welsh Government uh, had an observer status on SAGE. Um, I know that changed over time and during the pandemic, uh, which was helpful in clarifying some of the responsibilities. Um, we did end up converting this arrangement into the technical advice arrangements in Wales through the pandemic response. And do believe that that allowed us to understand the discharge of responsibilities in the Welsh context not to recreate um, all of the SAGE mechanisms, but to allow us to just simply translate the implications of that into the Welsh context, including the data and the evidence. And, and finally, what is the difference between the Emergency Coordination Centre, which is a, we understand, is a, is a Welsh Government well, as it says on the tin, Emergency Coordination Centre, and the Civil Contingencies and Incident Response Team. The, um, the Emergency Coordinating Centre is a physical response, uh, which involves the coordination activities and is located within Welsh Government, and that can be set up fully or in part on a 24-hour basis if needed during any emergency response. Um, but it is a physical entity in our local resilience for uh, arrangements across Wales. There are also physical locations where colleagues and staff do come together to actually oversee and coordinate the different activities. But isn't that what the Civil Contingencies and Incident Response Team does? It comes together as an incident, incident response team. And I read from your statement, to lead and facilitate the Welsh Government's response to civil emergencies. Well, what's the difference? Uh, 
the ECCW is, is the physical establishment of the centre. It's the building. It's the building, ah. plus where the desks and the individuals will be sat and discharges that coordinating focus within the building. So it's a, a physical establishment and was physical during the pandemic irrespective of, of course, other virtual arrangements. So is the short answer that the civil contingencies and incident response team work in the emergency coordination centre? Indeed. I think that's, lady, that's I think, about as far as I think any of us can go today. Is that a convenient 20. moment? I'm sorry we have to break off, Dr Goodall, but um, I, I think you're prepared for it. No, my lady, I understand. Uh, I shall return at 10 o'clock tomorrow, please.